We're getting very near the end of Paul's letter to the Galatians. We're in chapter 6, and we shall finish it a fortnight this morning. Galatians 6, 6 to 10. A person who is being taught to understand God's word should give his teacher a share in the material things of life. Don't be under any illusion. No one can turn their nose up at God and get away with it. It is a universal law that a man must reap exactly what he has been sowing. If he cultivates his old self, he will harvest a character that has gone rotten. If he cultivates God's spirit, that spirit will produce life of a lasting quality. So let us never get fed up with doing good. One day there'll be a grand harvest if we don't give up. So whenever we get the chance, let's give as much help as we can to everybody and especially to our immediate family of fellow believers. We've come now to the last part of Paul's letter to the Galatians, which seems at first sight to be made up of all those odds and ends that come in at the end of letters. After you've covered the main ground, you tend to stick in everything else that you just want to say. But there are no odds and ends to God. And one of the proofs to me of the inspiration of God's word is that it's often the little odds and ends and the little asides and the little things just squeezed in between important paragraphs that have something very profound to say. Now the section we've read from verses 6 to 10 seems, as I've said, at first sight to be just odds and ends or if you like separate pearls of wisdom. But I want to ask, is there a string tying these pearls together? Is there a theme that's running through these odds and ends? And I think there is. It is the theme of sowing and reaping. And as soon as you say that, everything that Paul writes in this section hangs together and becomes part of a theme. First of all, he's going to talk about those who sow the word. And that's what I'm doing this morning. I haven't really changed jobs since I stopped being a farmer and became a preacher. I'm sowing in soul rather than soil now, but I'm still sowing. And a preacher is a man who goes forth to sow. And the seed is God's word. In the second case, he talks about those who are sowing habits. And this is something every one of us has been doing this last week. We have been sowing habits and we are going to reap a character as a result. And the third kind of sowing he mentions are those who travel through this world sowing good and generous deeds in other people's lives. Sometimes that's a very discouraging thing to do. There are not always immediate results. People are not always appreciative or thankful. And it's so easy to give up. But again, Paul says, if you're sowing something, there will be a harvest. So you don't need to give up. Now that's the theme for this morning. The first example of it is, to say the least, an embarrassing verse for a preacher to have to expound. And somebody said to me last Sunday morning, why didn't you include verse 6? Are you going to leave that out? And I said, no, but I thought it would be better dealt with as a quick introduction to a study than a grand climax. <laughs> so I left it off last time. But um, that's the great advantage to preachers of expounding the whole word of God. We've got to say things that we'd never choose to preach about. So let's look at verse 6. Some people have said it goes better with verses 1 to 5, which talk about the mutual carrying of burdens within the Christian fellowship and say that this is another example, that the preacher or the teacher who is spending time teaching God's words to others should have the material burdens of his life carried by those who benefit from his teaching. 
So it does link with verses 1 to 5. But it also links with verses 6 to 10 in that it is an example of sowing and reaping. And Paul makes the rather blunt and to some embarrassing statement that a man who sows spiritual things will reap material things. Well, let's take this very steadily and carefully and look at what Paul is actually saying. First of all, there is the principle that all of us need teachers to help us to understand God's word. Which is why when Jesus ascended on high and led captivity captive and gave different gifts to men, among those gifts he included the gift of teacher. To help the whole body of Christ to understand what God has said in his word. And the rather poignant question of the Ethiopian eunuch when Philip found him in his chariot reading the prophet Isaiah and asked him, do you understand what you read? The poignant question was, how can I unless someone should guide me? And it is a principle of God's dealings with us that he has spoken and that he will send teachers to explain to us and help us to understand what God has said. Now there are two dangers that I think we need to avoid in this matter of understanding God's word. One is to treat any teacher as a pope. I mean by that to say because Mr. So-and-so says that's in the Bible or that's what the Bible means, that settles it. It doesn't. And I hope that all of you have heard it often enough from me now to know that I do not expect you to accept everything I say is in the Bible because I've said it. I want you to do what the Berean Christians in Acts 17 did with Paul himself. After he argued with them out of the scriptures, they went to their own homes, took down their Bibles, and searched the scriptures for themselves to see whether these things were so. And I hope you do that when I've tried to open a passage to you. I hope you go home and say, I'm not taking Mr. Paulson's word for it. I'm going to read it for myself and see if what he said was there is there. And if it isn't there, you can safely scrap what I've said. And you can do what some do from time to time and write me a letter and say you shouldn't have said it because it's not there. And that's helpful. You might get a letter back from me as well. <laughs> But then we're free to discuss together the things of the Lord. That is one mistake we make in the realm of teachers. We accept one teacher as a pope, as an infallible guide. And there is no such teacher on earth. And indeed the preacher, no less than the hearers, is on his way toward holiness and sanctification. He has not arrived. He is not already perfect and can therefore let his own thinking and feelings affect his preaching and teaching. The other error, and this is equally common, is to make yourself your own pope. And to say, all I need is the Bible and the Holy Spirit. I don't need to learn from human teachers. That goes right against the New Testament teaching about teachers. And yet Christians are prone to do this. Having reached a certain stage of understanding, it's terribly easy to say, now I know enough to be my own teacher. I don't need any commentaries. I don't need any preachers. I am able by myself to interpret infallibly the word of God. I've said this before and I mean it with my tongue in my cheek. Um, I do admire the Roman Catholics for limiting themselves to one pope. Because I think on our side of the fence we produce many, many popes. Teachers who are regarded as infallible and individual Christians who think they know enough about the word of God to do without any teacher. So here are two dangers we need to avoid. Avoiding the two extremes of regarding a teacher as infallible or regarding myself as sufficiently infallible not to need a teacher. God has given teachers to open the word of God to people. It's part of his plan. 
Now, the second thing is the bit that can be embarrassing. For moving from the teacher whose job it is to give the scripture to people, we move to the principle that the pupil's return is to give material support to the teacher. Now, I can say straight away that there is no need for me to underline this in this situation. Though I believe there are many situations in which men labor long and lovingly to help people to understand the word of God and are, as a result, inadequately supported in a material way. So I feel I can expound this for the sake of some of my brethren who have the gift and ministry of teaching for whom the second part of this verse is not applied by those who benefit from their teaching. I want to try and break down, if I can this morning, the false dual morality that is often laid down as between what are wrongly described as clergy and laity, or those in full-time Christian service and those who earn a living as butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, and what have you. It is often thought, even if it's not said, but I dare say that perhaps many of you have this feeling as I'm talking now, that a person in full-time Christian service ought somehow to be above such matters as wages or salaries. That it's all right for a company director to have a salary, it's all right for a factory worker to have a, a wage or a salesman or a shopkeeper, but to talk of ministers and missionaries in the same kind of language is somehow a little unholy. Now, this is to produce a false dichotomy among God's people. And it's interesting that again and again in the scriptures, those who are in full-time Christian service of a missionary or a ministering kind, again and again the phrase used is, the laborer is worthy of his hire. It is no more moral or immoral for me to be on a wage as for any of you to be on a wage. And we must break down this kind of thinking that says of a full-time Christian worker they must be without a wage, a wage and live, in quotes, by faith. Everybody's got to live by faith, whether they have a wage or not. Let's stop using this phrase, living by faith, if we mean by that living without a wage. Let's say everybody's got to live by faith, be they a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, teacher, or missionary. And let's see the whole of the people of God in the same kind of way and the same kind of thinking. This is why in the New Testament on at least eight occasions, and if you want the texts, I'll give them to you afterwards, the New Testament talks about paid teaching or evangelistic ministers. Some sections of the Christian church have felt the New Testament does not have paid ministers, but the principle is utterly clear. Now, having made that clear, and you can look at 1 Corinthians 9, or 1 Timothy 5, or 1 Thessalonians 2, or 2 Corinthians 11, or Philippians 4, or Luke 10, that's enough to be going on with in which they all speak of a person in full-time Christian service being worthy of higher, higher, and of wages. Now, having said that, let me say that once again there are two dangers here. And the first danger is for preachers, and the second danger is for congregations. The danger for preachers is to be become professional and to do it for the money. And as soon as a man finds that in his heart, he must stop taking the money for his own spiritual good. That's the danger on the preacher's side, that it becomes no more than a job. He's just doing it as a job because he gets wages. And that's a very subtle thing. But then, if you're doing your job just to get wages, you are equally immoral. Do you see the difference? Unless you are doing your job for the Lord Jesus and I'm doing my job for the Lord Jesus. 
our motives are wrong if we're doing it with one eye on the clock and the other on the page, wage packet. We're not Christians, either of us. And therefore, what I'm trying to say is I as a minister, as a pastor and teacher, am paid a wage and I have a job. But I must do it for the glory of God. And so must you. Let's treat each other in the same way and not have these higher groups of people who live by faith. If the Lord tells you to live without a wage, then you must live without a wage. If the Lord tells you to live with a wage, you're living with a wage. Both ways you're being faithful to the Lord's leading. The other danger is in the congregation. If you realize, as you ought to, that I'm in a job and that you pay me for the job, you must not therefore expect me to teach what you want to hear. That's the danger when it's put on the level of a job that whoever pays the piper calls the tune. And that cannot be done in a congregation. A teacher must teach the word of God and be free to do so. And therefore Paul does not talk about it as a payment but as a partnership as a sharing so that each of us is sharing what we have to give with the other and I am able to share because you've set me apart from a normal occupation I am able to share the fruits of the hours that are spent studying God's word and preparing the meal for you so that you having spent a busy week earning your money can come and put that offering in and receive the benefits of the teaching and that's what God intended. Now, having got through verse 6, I can now leave it. <laughs> Enough said, a word to the wise. The second way in which we sow and reap, the first is the teacher sowing spiritual and reaping material. The second way is not concerned with what we sow in our instructor, but with what we sow in our character. And here Paul starts with a pretty blunt statement, don't fool yourself, you can't fool God. Don't fool yourself, you can't fool God. I suppose the worst kind of deception is to deceive yourself. Many of us do it, perhaps all of us do it. Perhaps all of us have a different view of ourselves to the one that corresponds to reality don't deceive yourself don't fool yourself don't be under any illusions says Paul no one can fool God literally he says in the Greek and you may have thought this is a phrase from JDP it isn't it's a, a phrase from SP St. Paul and St. Paul writes this no man can turn his nose up at God quite literally that's the phrase he uses Meaning no man can sneer at God. No man can say to God, you've got nothing on me. I can get away with it. No man can despise God in this way. And in particular, he is referring to this delusion that many, many men and women are under. And that is that they've got away with it. And that's a terrible delusion. A man has fooled himself if he thinks he's fooled God into getting away with wrongdoing. You can't fool God. As someone has said, God doesn't send his bills in every Friday, but his accounts must be settled. And because we get away with things for a time, that doesn't mean we've got away with things and we can cock a snook at God. Don't fool yourself. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. It's a universal law. It's written into nature. What have you been sowing in your garden in the last few weeks? And what will you be sowing in the next few weeks? Then I will tell you exactly what you will reap. And what you will get later this year. It may be many months before you get it. But I'll tell you exactly what you'll get if you tell me exactly what you've done in your garden. We've been sowing some nettles, and one or two other things like that, and I know what we'll get later in the year, unless we do something radical about it. But whatever you've been sowing in your garden, that you will reap. We forget that what applies to nature applies to human nature because we are part of God's creation. 
And don't fool yourself what a man sows, he will reap. The bills must be paid and the accounts must be settled. And I want to try and help you now to realize something very important. That forgiveness does not wipe out the consequences of our wrongdoing. It only removes the penalty. Now this is terribly, terribly important. Because there are those who wrongly feel, even after they've become a Christian, that now forgiveness is available, they can do what they like and they'll never have to pay. But they will. For this law, whatever a man sows, that will he reap, applies to a Christian as much as to anybody else. And Paul is writing to Christians here and telling them the law applies to them. It is true that if a Christian sins, the penalty of that sin, broken fellowship with God, can be removed and it can be restored by forgiveness. But the consequence of it cannot be. That remains. And this is the law of God in nature and human nature. Can I use my familiar illustration to get the difference between penalty and consequence? A small boy climbs into someone else's garden and pinches some half-ripe apples and eats them. He is discovered. The penalty for that is that he gets spanked. The consequence is that he gets tummy ache. Now these two pains in different parts of it, his anatomy are totally different in nature. One of them can be removed by forgiveness but the other cannot. And however much the owner of the garden forgives the boy, he can't remove the tummy ache. Now do you see the difference? And it's terribly important to realize that the law of harvest applies to every human nature, including Christian human nature. Let me give some other examples. King David was a man after God's own heart, a good man, a man of faith, a man of humility, a man of courage. We'll say more about him tonight. But after King David fell, he paid the consequence for the rest of his ministry, for the rest of his reign, for the rest of his time. And the sword never left his land until he died. And God said, that's going to be the consequence of this. And while God forgave him and out of his sin came the wonderful psalm of confession, Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God. Nevertheless, though the penalty was removed, the consequences remained for the rest of his life. Let me take another example, a very simple one. Take a sin that we don't always count as a sin, that we don't take too seriously, gluttony. Gluttony. A hotel proprietor used to tell me that he had conferences of clergymen and church people at the hotel and he always used to ask the organizer, is it going to be a high church conference or a low church conference? And the organizer would say, well, what difference does that make to the hotel side? And he said, a lot of difference to the catering because the high church drink and the low church eat. Now you can make of that what you like. But digging your grave with your knife and fork, which is Billy Graham's definition of gluttony, is a sin, according to the Bible, to overeat. Now then, that therefore is bound to carry the penalty of reduced enjoyment of fellowship with God. A penalty that is removed as soon as it is confessed. But the consequences of gluttony and overweight don't vanish with your forgiveness or of a bad digestive system or of a whole lot of other things that will come later in life as the result. Now this is what Paul is saying here. Whatever a man sows, be he unbeliever or believer, that he will reap. And therefore he now applies this very directly and says, if you sow to your old self, you are bound to reap a character that is rotten. 
Meaning if you indulge your pride, your lust, your greed, your gluttony, your envy, whatever. Every time you do this, you are sowing something that will reap a harvest. Again, I remember as a boy a magnificent children's address. You do remember those, don't you, the children's talks? And this was about a boy who stole a melon from his father's melon patch. And after he'd eaten it, he got worried about the penalty. And so he, he got the skin and the pips that were lying all around his feet after he'd eaten it. And he dug a little hole next to the garden path and he buried them. And he went in and he thought, that's it. You know, he waited for a few days and his father never noticed that the ripest melon had gone. So he thought, I've got away with it. It was only some weeks later that his father came in to tea and sat down and said, you know, I've just seen a rather funny thing. There's a melon plant coming up next to the garden path. <laughs> and looking around the table, he saw a boy with a red face. You got the message? Paul says, if you indulge your old self, even though forgiveness removes the penalty, there will be consequences to face. When the prodigal son got back home, forgiveness removed the penalty, which was estrangement from his father, but it did not remove the consequence that he'd lost all his money. For all that was the father's now belonged to the elder brother. And it is a solemn warning, a necessary reminder to us that whatever a man sows, that will he reap. Therefore, if I sow to the Spirit, what kind of harvest am I building up for the future? A life of lasting quality. That's the nearest I can get to get across eternal life. It's not just a life of quantity. It's a life of quality. It's a life of a particular character. And there is written into the life of the flesh in this world decay and corruption. And there is written into the life of the spirit durability, eternity. And therefore the more I sow to the flesh, other things being equal, the shorter I will live. And other things being equal, the less the quality of my life. And if I sow to the Spirit, other things being equal, the longer I live and the more quality of life I enjoy. Life in the Spirit. The third way in which we sow is to sow good deeds. Now, one of the hardest lessons in Christianity is to learn where good deeds fit into the Christian life. If I begin by a little cliché, or a little um, proverb or whatever, this might help. A Christian is someone who does good deeds. But a person who does good deeds is not necessarily a Christian. Do you understand what I'm saying? A Christian is someone who does good deeds, but someone who does good deeds is not necessarily a Christian. Let me explain. The whole of the letter to the Galatians so far has been making it quite clear that I am not saved by good deeds. Nobody ever made it to glory by good deeds. Nobody ever became a Christian by following through the scout law of doing a good deed every day. Nobody ever managed it because nobody ever became good enough. But here's the other side of the coin. I am not saved by good deeds, but I am saved for good deeds. There were little badges given out in our Sunday school when I was a boy. So there's nothing new in badges, is there? And on it it said, saved to serve. Do you remember that? A slogan of a former generation, saved to serve. To do good deeds, not saved by them, but saved for them. Not to do good deeds in order to get to heaven, but to do them because I'm going there. That's the place of good deeds in the Christian life. And so Paul says, don't get fed up with doing good deeds. Do you know it's the easiest thing in the world? You try and go about like our Lord doing good. And I will guarantee that very quickly you will be discouraged. Become weary and be tempted to grow slack 
and flag. Why? Because this is not a world in which it pays to do good or to be good. It's not a world in which somebody going around doing good will be universally popular. And above all, it's not a world in which doing good brings immediate results. I would say that one of the curses of our mid-20th century world is the word instant. Instant. It's there everywhere. Instant coffee. Instant this. Instant that. We want to live in a world in which you press a button and something comes out of the slot. That's our mentality. It's got to be quick. It's got to be immediate. We've got to see immediate results or we get so easily discouraged. We live in an instant world and God's world is not an instant world. I've been a farmer and you can't have instant crops. In fact, farming is a very healthy life because it keeps you geared to God's speed. You can't hurry up God's nature very much. You can hurry it a wee bit with fertilizers and other things. But a farmer has to learn to be patient because nature has its own speed. It is the artificial technological age that has instant results. And because of this, we don't adapt easily to God's spiritual world. We want things to happen by next Thursday at the latest. All of us have had this temptation. Didn't you, within six months of becoming a Christian, want to be a missionary in China? Straight away. And you wanted to be up and off. And you wanted to go out and witness. And you wanted to go out on a Saturday afternoon and come home in the evening rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. And you went out and there weren't such instant results. Do you know I know missionaries in Arabia who have been preaching the gospel for 40 years and they haven't seen their first convert yet. But they do it in the toughest mission field in the world, quite sure that they're sowing a seed that is bound to have a harvest and that there must be some secret believers in that Muslim world in whose hearts there's been germination. And they've done it for 40 years without a convert. I don't think I could keep it up like that. We want instant results and there won't be instant results. And so Paul says, when you go out into the world doing good, sow the seed of good deeds in your neighbor, but don't expect instant results. Don't expect them to say, oh, for that I'm going to come to your church next Sunday. Don't expect it. When you invite your neighbor to come along, don't expect them to come the first time. Just go on sowing the seed. There is a time for casting bread on waters and believing that after many days the tide will bring it back again. So don't let's get weary of doing good because there's going to be a harvest there's got to be, if God is God and nature is nature and human nature is human nature, sow the seed of goodness and there's bound to be a harvest. I like to think that Jesus was content to let someone else reap where he'd sown. For three years he went about doing good and the result, he was left alone. Alone. Not even his disciples stayed. But seven weeks later, 3,000, 3,000. Do you think that had nothing to do with Jesus going about doing good? Why, Peter in his second sermon, or in the sermon he preached to Cornelius, could say, you know how Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good, and the harvest that was reaped was the result of Jesus sowing, though he didn't see it before he died. And in the same way, I believe that a congregation like this, scattered through this community, going about doing good, there may not be immediate results, but Paul says, don't give up. One day there's going to be a harvest if we don't give up. So let's go on doing good. To whom? Well, finally, there is a circumference of a Christian's good deeds and a center, a large circle and an immediate circle. And we must be careful to keep them in balance. Number one, the circumference of our good deeds is the world that God loved. Everybody. 
I've just jotted down what John Wesley said in one of his sermons to his converts and I think it's so worthwhile that I'm almost tempted to give it dictation speed so that you could write it down. If you want it, come and see me afterwards. This is what he said. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. That's a great seven-point sermon for Christians. Let me repeat it. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. That's enough to be going on with for most Christians. And that's the circumference of our help. But now let's zoom in, let's focus down. A Christian has a duty to help anybody in the world in need, anybody at all. But he has a particular duty and responsibility to help his own family. The Bible is very strong on this, that a man or a woman who neglects their own family to help others is doing something wrong. Shall I quote you one text in the New Testament, which you may not know, but which is pretty strong? Whoever provides not for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. Sounds as if there's a baby from someone's household needs providing for <laughs> immediately. Nevertheless, whoever provides not for his own household. Charity begins at home, but it mustn't end there. And for the Christian home, family, is this family, brothers and sisters in Jesus. And we have a special duty to our brothers and sisters to do good to them. Why? Because the world may not do good to them. Second, because they are my brother and sister and therefore my first duty are to my relatives. Thirdly, because the Lord says so and that's good enough for me. But here is the circumference. How far out do we go? To the world. But where do we start? With the church. Learn to do good to your spiritual brother and sister and then you'll be able to go out and do good to others. Well, this is our message for this morning. It's not the most exciting part of Galatians by a long way. It's rather down to earth. It's a bit grim. It's rather sober. And yet don't we need this too? Let us sow that we may reap in our instructor, in our character, in our neighbor and be quite certain of this that whatever you sow you will reap God says so that's good enough for me let us pray Father I'd like to thank you for the privilege of sowing your word in hearts this morning I thank you for the harvest that's going to come because that seed is your word. Lord, we thank you for the solemn reminder that even as Christians we need to be sowing to the spirit and not to the flesh every day and every week that what we sow we shall reap. Father, we thank you that we can go out this week into this community and wherever we see a need, we can sow a good deed right there. And we praise you that that's not going to be wasted either. And that one day there will be a harvest and we'll know the fruits of what we've done. Lord, thank you that you don't let seed be wasted and that you are the Lord of the harvest. And at this springtime when people are putting seeds in the soil and doing it with absolute confidence that what they plant there is going to bring a rich result. Lord, may we not grow weary in well-doing. For your name's sake. Amen. Hymn number 509. 
take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. 509. After this hymn, we come to the Lord's table, and we invite all those who love and know the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord to come to the table with us. Take bread and wine. 509.